Hello, and now we're to the scalable system. So we're you're going to start seeing that every time we start a new system, we're going to start with this idea that uh, they all have some function that we're going to really um, start to parse out. And the skeletal system is no uh, no exception. So the skeletal system, we've looked a lot at just identifying the bones. So just identifying, uh, when you're just naming something, you're just looking at its anatomy. But remember when we do these lectures, we're really looking at the physiology. So how they work, what they're made of, that kind of thing. And so if we're looking at the skeletal system, the first of, of its major functions is just shape and support. We would not have the shape that we have as bipedal or two-legged kind of support um, if we didn't have the skeletal system that we do. Uh, it also helps support our, uh, so the fact that our spine goes this way means that we, we can sit upright, which is important for humans. Um, the fact that our um, pelvic girdle is a certain shape, allows us to sit in certain ways and roll when we walk a certain way, lots of different things. But the uh, a bit, this is all uh, dictated by the shape of our skeleton. So our skeleton is very important uh, in uh, shaping and supporting our whole body. It's also very important in the protection of delicate tissues and organs. So the most obvious being everything in the rib cage. So one of the big functions of the rib cage is to protect the heart and the lungs. Um, it may be less obvious, but our guts and our reproductive organs, or at least the female case, are protected by the pelvic girdle. And then there is some protection of um, sensitive tissue, at least from the back by the spine. And the spine does, there's like the, the vertebral column does contain the spine. Uh, so that protects that as well. So the other thing, the important thing about bones is we wouldn't be able to move without bones. They provide a place for our muscles to anchor to and then leverage. Okay, so leverage as in like to cause and to use as a lever. So the fact, if you think about it, when you uh, flex your arm or you extend your arm, what you're doing is you have a muscle that is attached to both the humerus and, say, the uh, ulna. And when you flex the muscle that crosses these, it pulls the, your forearm towards your upper arm. Okay, so it's only because you have this place to anchor those muscles that those anchors have, or those muscles have any functionality at all and can allow movement. Um, so if you, if you think about it, if you didn't have the... Uh, the bone system for your muscles to attach to, they could contract all they want, but they wouldn't really do anything. They just kind of squish around a bit. So that's really important. Um, we also, our bones are actually really important in the production of blood cells. So hematopoiesis is the production of blood cells. This happens in our red bone marrow. We'll talk about the distinction between red and yellow bone marrow. Our, um, but on that point, we actually store a lot of our mineral reserves of calcium and phosphate in our bones. So we know this is true, especially if you um, are a uh, pregnant person, pregnant woman, and you have, um, if you are not taking in the right nutrients, and your baby, your pre, uh, your fetus is at a certain point that it's starting to um, be able to support itself as far as like taking nutrients, sort of. Um, if you're not taking the right prenatal vitamins and your fetus needs the, the uh, calcium in order to make its own bones, you'll, your body will start breaking down your own bone system and actually start leaching calcium from your teeth uh, before it lets the fetus go without it. So that is a terrifying version uh, or example of how our bones act as a calcium or phosphate reserve. But also if you, uh, we're going to talk about osteoporosis and how if you start to, if you don't take in enough calcium, your body will actually break down your bones in order to use calcium because calcium is really important in nerve production. Um, yeah, we'll get into that later. We also store a lot of energy in our yellow bone marrow. So if you've ever seen a dog or another animal really just like go to town chewing on a bone, what they're going for is that yellow bone marrow because it's very high energy. So if you look at a bone, and actually let's start, let's back up a little bit, and let's look at a bone like this. So you may have seen bone tissue that kind of looks like this. So if you take the head of the femur and you kind of cut it open, you have all this, uh, this is going to be really important. This is a certain kind of bone tissue called spongy bone tissue, and you can see it's kind of holy looking, and that's actually very important. Um, you also see there's a layer of what's called compact bone on the top of it. And then if you cut a cross section through this, so this is marrow here, uh, and if you look at it this way, you can see marrow fills in the gaps within these this cross hatching um, effect. Uh, if you so there's the yellow bone marrow, which exists inside of the uh, 
long bone, whichever long bone this is supposed to be, it's not a real one. But if you look a little bit closer, and let me find the picture I wanted, here it is. So if you do a cross section of a bone, if you, you have this big hole in the middle of the bone, the long bones, uh, that allows for, so that's basically what this is, okay? But if you take a cross section going this way, and you look at what's happening, you see that there's actually some other stuff going on. You see these circles going on, and those are called the osteons, and that's really important because what they're doing is, let's go back up here, so each one of those things is called an osteon, or the Haversian system, because that's the guy who figured it out. And what they are is they have a canal for blood vessels to come through. And remember, that was an important fact. So each one of these has a blood vessel coming through. Okay, so this they'll have a blood vessel on the outside that's feeding a muscle. But you can see where this blood vessel is. So there's a red for artery and blue for venous, which is, we'll talk about that later. Um, but they come out of that central pore of the osteon. And the reason why bones can heal a lot faster than cartilage is because they have a direct blood supply. So if you were to cut this bone or break this bone here, well, there's blood right there that can supply nutrients and um, healing factors, uh, which the cartilage does not do. So that's a big difference. So that central part of the osteon is where the blood vessels come through. Okay, you also from out, uh, so that's this also, um, you see surrounding at these the, these rings that look like the rings of a tree, and those are called lamellae. That's just growth rings, so it started out very small, and then it started to get bigger by laying down these calcium rings. The You have what are called osteocytes, which is a general word for bone cells that exist in the lacunae. And so the lacuni are these kind of like areas here. They're just kind of empty spots. Um, so they're important because that's where the active bone cells are. So they're maintaining the bone structure. So if this is a bone that uh, is being built up for growth or just maintenance, you're going to have a certain kind of bone cell or a certain osteocyte that's existing there. But then you're also going to have the other kind that's breaking down bone depending on how much stress you're putting on it that also exists in these chambers and can come out and be used anytime it needs to. Uh, you also have these little things called caniculi, which are little canals that are for nutrients. So they look like cracks, which seem like, oh, there's something wrong with this bone. There's so many cracks. But it's actually really important. So if this is the, where the blood comes in, but you have to feed the rest of this bone, you can be, the blood vessel can keep going, like in this case, it's coming out of the screen at us. And what's happening is if the blood vessel is coming out of the screen out of, at us, it's basically leaking, but on purpose, nutrients into these caniculi, these little tiny canals, uh, which can then feed the rest of the bone. So people don't really think about it, but when you're, um, so when you see bones, usually um, you might think about like cartoon bones that are all bleached by the sun and they're really hard, or the bones we see in class, which are dead bones and they're really hard. But by then, they've been um, completely uh, os osteized, which, yeah, yeah, that works. Um, they've been completely dehydrated, so all the water is gone. Uh, but the bones in our body are kind of squishy, not squishy, squishy, but if you think about like a chicken bone, if you've ever eaten chicken, those bones are kind of flexible, and it's, um, there's enough support in it, obviously, to support you, but the, uh, or the chicken in that case, but the idea is that this is a living tissue. You're not filled with a big, dead, hard skeleton. You're filled with a living system that is providing, it's, it's, it has to feed itself through these channels that are feeding, bringing the bloodstream. Uh, they then leak the nutrients into this caniculi, uh, and it, it has to maintain itself at all times, and that's like everything else in our body, it's a very complex system called homeostasis, which makes sure everything is um, doing what it's supposed to be doing at the right time, in, and it's your brain that's processing that to make sure everything's happening at the right time. We'll get into that a little bit more by talking about the difference between an osteoblast and an osteoclast. So osteocytes are just a very, this is kind of the, this, uh, let's kind of edit this a little bit. So the osteocytes are, is just a general uh, bone cell, okay? And that includes both the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts, okay? So if you are, let's... Da, da, da. I don't really like how this works. We're going to fix it right now. So the osteoblasts make the bone matrix, okay? So what they're doing is they're taking um, calcium phosphate and magnesium, uh, and they are creating bones, okay? So if you are building bone tissue either through growth or through uh, maintenance of bone, if you've started working out and doing resistance training of a certain kind, you start to lay down more bone tissue, um, if you're doing that, 
um, what you're doing is those osteoblasts are going in and making sure to build up your bone tissue, okay? So they're synthesizing that bone matrix. Uh, on the other hand, we also have osteoclasts, which are your bone eaters. And what they do is what they, they go in and they release hydrochloric acid, which is the same acid that's released in our stomach, and it breaks down that bone matrix. And that's actually really important also. So if you're starting to reshape your bones in certain ways, such as at puberty, um, it's the osteoclasts that go in and start to break down that matrix so the osteoblasts can relay down those bones in those bone cells in a, or that matrix in a different way. So if you think about, we know that the uh, pelvic girdle or the ilium, the oscoxa, which is the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis bones, well, they are different shapes in males and females. Well, they don't start out different shapes. So if you, you can't, it, uh, it's hard to identify um, the sex of a young skeleton by just looking at the hips. You, you can't see that until puberty happens. And so at puberty, estrogen controls your osteoblast and osteoclastic action um, in females to lay down, so to go in and say, okay, break down the bones that aren't shaped exactly the way I need them to, at least break down the edges of them, and start regrowing with the osteoblast in a way that's going to help us hold babies later in life, if that's what you choose to do. Um, the body's ready for it, apparently. Uh, so, that, these two work in very close, uh, context. So if you, you very rarely only have one or the other, so it, it usually, you can't just, like, randomly lay down a whole bunch of bone matrix. Um, the osteoblast will go to lay down in a certain way, and if it's not perfect, the osteoclasts come in and change it up to make sure. Um, but it's really important to remember that blasts are builders, and clasts are the ones that break things down. So you may know the word iconoclast. So that's someone who breaks down idols or icons. Um, it's the same. Clastic means to break down or to change. And so that's in, uh, one way to kind of remember this word. But do make sure you know the difference. Osteoblasts build bones. Osteoclasts break them down using hydrochloric acid. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about bone growth. Let's first identify the parts of a bone. So the so we just looked at the microscopic structure. Okay, so the microscopic structure. If you go in and you do a cross section of the bone and you start to see these little ring patterns, that gets you the uh, the osteon system. If you look at the macroscopic, so we already know by looking at this bone, this must be the femur because it has this very big head. But we can see in a lot of different bones, we see this very different kind of um, tissue. Well, we'll talk about tissue in a second. But what you see is uh, if you have a long bone or any kind of bone that's just longer than it is wide, you are going to have a shaft. So this middle part is called the shaft or the diaphysis. And yes, you have to know all the words. Um, either end is called the epiphysis or epiphysis depending on how you want to pronounce it. So um, in some cases, there's a very clear head. So this is the head of the femur. Um, this is the part that articulates or connects with the patella and the tibia and fibula. Um, it doesn't, it's not called the foot or the butt. It's just not called the head. But in either case, the ends of long bones are called epiphyses, or epiphy each one is an epiphysis. Okay, that's going to be important because we're going to talk about the epiphyseal plate in a few minutes. Okay, so the inside, if you have a long bone that contains marrow, you'll have a medullary cavity, and we're going to learn a lot that medullary means middle, okay? Um, it's called the marrow canal, or, no, I'm sorry, marrow cavity, or the medullary cavity, which means middle cavity, and that's just where you can fill up with bone marrow, which is basically a lot of stem cells uh, that can create uh, blood tissue, or create blood, okay? Um surrounding the, uh, let's see, so we have two different kinds of bone, too. let's not talk about that yet, okay, we have the endosteum, uh, that is going to be the collagen that lines that cavity, okay, it doesn't really show it really well here, but the medullary or marrow cavity is going to have an inner layer called the endosteum, and then surrounding the entire bone is the periosteum, Okay, so it's just this collagen that holds the whole bone together in a certain shape. Okay, so that's important to know. Make sure you know. So the diaphysis is the shaft. The epiphyses are the ends on either side. We have the medullary cavity on the inside that's lined by the endosteum. And then we have the periosteum that covers the entire bone. And that's really important. The uh, periosteum is important also because that's the collagen that is continuous with ligaments. So your ligaments are what connect your muscles 
to your bones, okay? So there are certain kind of cartilage and collagen. Um, your tendons connect your muscles to muscles, okay? So keep that in mind. Your ligaments are going to be, um, like, let's say your ACL is your anterior cruciating ligaments, and that's um, a lot of people, times people will tear their ACL. And so what that means is they've torn the ligament that is connecting the uh, muscles in the front of their thigh uh, across the knee. And so a lot of times once that ligament tears, so that would be going like here, floop, uh, and that once that tears, it's really hard to get it to heal because you're constantly moving your knee. So it, if you want it to heal, you have to do something or even go in and replace that ligament so that it, it is going to be continuous, that periosteum again, and with the muscles that are um, connecting it. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, so let's talk about the two types of bone tissue. So again, here is... Um, a femur, I guess, and it's, we've taken a cross section, we know this is the medullary cavity, it's filled with marrow and also the blood vessels, the blood vessels then, you can see this one's gone off because in through a pore, uh, into the osteon canals, um, in order to feed the rest of the tissue. Um, most of our bone is compact bone, and so that's this really hard osteon system that's really tightly packed, and it provides really good support up and down because it's just this really solid, even with all these little tiny pores, it's a mostly solid, very thick structure so that you can put a lot of weight on a long bone without it breaking, okay? Um, all the osteons line up in one direction, so when you stand on a femur this way, it's very, very strong. However, if you were to put the same weight on a femur that's laying on its side, it's going to break. So you know, hopefully this has never happened to anyone, but, um, and it just is gross to think about, but if you uh, were to stand on somebody's leg with the same weight that you put on your femur just perpendicularly, you are likely to break someone's leg that way. And the reason why is because they're, while the long bones when their osteons are all lined up in one direction, they're really strong. So, but they're only providing that force in one direction, okay? Once you go this way, all of a sudden you're uh, lining up against all of that. You're basically going um, perpendicular to that grain. They don't have support that way, and that's when breaks happen. So that's the compact tissue. So that's where any place you're going to be finding those osteon systems. However, our bone is not just compact tissue, because if it was, it would be incredibly heavy, and you would only have strength in one direction. So instead, we also have spongy bones. So when you think about a bone at the ends of our, so within basically the epiphyses, uh, the ends of the bones, you have this spongy tissue. So it's called the epi it's found in the epiphyses. You don't have osteons instead, so you have instead this very intense matrix that's pushing in all directions, but it's not as filled in. And the reason why is because that makes the bone lighter, so you can actually move, like imagine how giant our muscles would have to be just to carry our bones around if this was completely solid. It would be ridiculous. Um, these are really important in um, joint formation because you have to be able to, and the space allows it to be lightweight, but you have to be able to apply, like if this is the end of the femur and you have your knee, uh, you, you don't just apply force on that femur in one direction at the knee. When you're walking, it's always at a continuously changing angle. So in order to be able to take that force, you um, have to have a system that can support in all directions, and that's what the spongy tissue allows. Um, they're not just empty spaces, though, because that could break. And so those empty spaces are actually filled with red bone marrow, which are creating blood cells. Remember, so in the diaphysis here, the diaphysis or diaphysis, that's going to be yellow bone marrow, which is holding a lot of energy. The red bone marrow in the epiphysis is going to be uh, creating blood cells. All right. So how does the structure of bone, how does the structure of bone make it strong yet lightweight? That's going to be the spongy bone tissue allows it to take force in multiple directions, by be, but by being spongy, it's not super heavy. What organelles do you suppose are responsible for osteoclastic activity? So if osteoclasts are breaking things down, and this is kind of a really hardcore throwback to our cell unit, um, the parts of the cells that are responsible for breaking things down are called lysosomes. And what they do is they just secrete digestive juices. So in osteoclasts, they are just full of tons of lysosomes filled with hydrochloric acid, which they can just spit out onto the bone matrix when they need to. Uh, and we talk about this so many times. Why, how would you explain to an athlete why damaged joint ligaments and cartilages are so, so slow to heal compared to bones? Cartilage has no blood supply. It has to be fed, or no direct blood supply. It has to get it kind of slowly from surrounding tissue, whereas bones have direct blood supply. So they are allowed, they could get those healing factors a lot quicker and a lot more nutrients. 
All right, so what about, uh, what? so ossification. Ossification is the development of bone. And so when you look at an embryo, it's um, all soft tissues, which is very important if you're going to be giving birth to something uh, that is very, very large in comparison to the hole that it is coming out of. You want it to be full of lots of soft tissue so that it can get out of the birth canal. Uh, there are examples in nature of like sharks that get so big they cannot be born, and then both the mother and the fetus die during birth. And so that's a horrible, horrible thing. Uh, and so in the case of humans, we have a very soft skull at birth, so we, the bone is not fully awesome, or yeah, the bone isn't fully ossified, so it's not fully hard yet, but it's also not fully connected, so babies have those soft spots, those fontanelles, that are later going to fuse, so that um, they can um, protect the skull in a better way, but our head is so giant, because our, our brain is so complex, that we have to have a squishy skull when we're born, so that we can actually be born, otherwise we would not have gotten to this point as a species. Oh, uh, let's see, anytime you have soft tissue, so this is a slide that has been um, died looking for certain kinds of cartilage. Um, and it's sort of important to know. So we have this connective tissue called fibrous connective tissue in our flat bones, like the skull plates, um, maybe the sternum and parts of the ilium. Um, our hyaline, uh, hyaline cartilage actually forms the long bones, all the other bones, and then all of this is replaced by that uh, calcium phosphate matrix when bones are forming. Uh, so here we go. We have what's called intramembranous bone formation. So in our flat bones, like the skull, we have, so what we know of now as the frontal bone, the parietal bone, the occipital, the temporal, the sphenoid, the ethmoid, which is on the inside, all of these things are, if you look just at a skull, you're like, no, it's just a skull with some sutures. Why do I have to know all these different things? Well, you have to know all these different things because when you're born, they're all separate parts. And so in order to, um, for these to all come, they, they do eventually all come together by creating um, those connective tissues that are supporting to make sure they're not just drifting apart from each other. Um, they are filled with those osteoblasts. And those osteoblasts or the osteoblast progenitors are then going to start creating bones to knit these together. This also, the fact that they're not connected allows growth to happen. Because if you imagine this whole thing fuses together, well, then what do you do if your brain keeps growing? Nothing. Your brain can't grow any bigger if all of these bones are fused together in the bone, the brain is already filling all that space. So it's actually, there's a double importance to our having these fontanelles, uh, these uh, soft spots in the baby skull, because it allows us to be born and it allows us for br uh, bone, sorry, brain growth as we're developing uh, without being hampered by the skull being too hard. Okay, let's keep going. All right. Another very important form of ossification is it happens at mostly at puberty or um, so if you've ever had a growing pain, so if you either have a teenager or remember your teenage years, there's you just have these aches and they're horrible and you cannot like stop the aching. You might be able to like take a bath or put hot packs or ice packs or something. But why do you hurt so much? And it's because your bones during puberty, they get the signal that, oh my God, it's time to grow. You're, you have all the right nutrients. Uh, it's time to get ready for reproduction, which sounds terrifying if you're thinking this is happening in like 14, 15 year olds. Um, but their brains don't know any better. So what's happening is um, if you, if this is the bone, okay, so here's the bone. This is the uh, epiphysis. So let's actually go back to, let's look at, yeah, let's let's look here. So you have to the bone here. You have the epiphyseal plates. Those are where growth happens. And so what's happening here is once puberty gives the signal, it, you start building so much bone in those two places, not the rest of the bone. It's just where the epiphysis connects with the diaphysis that you see the bone cells just start going crazy and pushing the bones in different directions. Okay or the bone itself in two directions. So you're basically stretching out that bone just by filling in at those epiphyseal plates. So you can tell if somebody has gone through puberty looking at the bones because there's a signal as soon as you get this big estrogen spike in both men and with males and females, that epiphyseal plate fuses and growth stops. So we do still have growth in other bones, like our we have our intervertebral discs in between our vertebral column, um, in between our vertebrae, will continue to grow as we get older, and then they start to lose water, so they, we actually shrink a little bit. Um, but our main growth, so our main, um, so we have a huge surge in growth or growth spurt at puberty, which then is stopped by a giant estrogen spike. Uh, we don't finish growing fully until maybe mid-20s. 
Um, and that's, again, there's some osteoblastic activity ha that's causing that to happen, but it's mostly um, in the spine later. Uh, but let's go back here. Uh, okay, so what happens if you hit puberty really early? Well, you didn't have a lot of time to just keep continually growing. So people who go through growth spurts really early don't get very tall because your bone is just kind of continually growing at a normal rate. La la la. And then puberty happens and then that epiphyseal plate goes crazy and you get this huge growth spurt and it's growing, 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 growing. And then boom, estrogen hits and puberty's over. Well, if you hit puberty at a young age, you don't get a lot of growth before puberty happens. So you basically are starting off shorter than someone else who uh, waits for a really long time to go through puberty. Um, you also, if you aren't getting the proper nutrients during puberty or before puberty, you could end up shorter than uh, maybe expected because your bones just aren't laying down as much material in order to grow. Oh, but so one of the things about growing pains is that your bones are growing, 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 but your muscles on top of them aren't growing as quickly. And so you start to, so you're stretching out those bones and your muscles are having to adjust, but they, they don't know. And they're not, they're just muscles. They don't know what's happening. They just realize they're being stretched a whole lot. And that can be really painful. All right. So you can see that epiphyseal plate when you look at x-rays. So this is a, uh, someone who has not gone through puberty or maybe they're going through puberty right here. And so what's happening here is the plate has not fused yet. So there's still growth happening. And what's happening during that time is you just have way more osteoblastic activity than you have osteoclastic. So you're building, building, building as much as possible. Uh, in either case, you're building, so there's cartilage on either side that's pushing the bone in both directions, and then that gets turns in, turned into bone material. Um, there is, uh, you do sometimes have osteoclastic, you do actually have osteoclastic activity. So the idea is if you take, um, once you go through puberty, you start shape, again, like we talked about with the, uh, the, the, Sorry, the 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 oh goodness, the pelvic girdle. You start to see a shaping, both in men and female, um, uh, males and females, going from kind of the kid version to the adult versions of the hips. Uh, and it's all about what the hips are going to be used for. Okay, so are you going to be um, uh, making babies or not making babies? That's going to shape what your hips look like. We also see that in other bones as well, but mostly in the hips and sometimes the jaw. All right, so here's a very important point that can be really hard to think about, but our bones are a calcium reservoir. So we have all this calcium just hanging out in our bones all the time, and we need it to be there because it makes the bones hard and gives us a place, uh, all that strength in our bones so we can use them for leverage and to protect our muscles and all these things, or sorry, to protect our tissue. But what if our body is running out of calcium? So your body is not going to let you die from calcium deficiency which and you need calcium for your ner uh, sorry, your nerves to work, you're not going to die of calcium deficiency without first trying to break down your bones, okay? And so there's two hormones that maintain this balance. There's thyrocalcitonin, which I've also only just heard as calcitonin because there's not a non-thyrocalcitonin, so you'll probably hear me refer to it as calcitonin. And then there's parathyroid hormone. So the thyroid gland, which sits on uh, the front of your throat. If you've ever seen someone with a goiter, you know that's actually what's been, um, we'll talk about that later. But um, thyroid sits on the front of your, um, uh, if you're a man, it's in your Adam's apple and females. We also have the, what is the Adam's apple, but it's not as big. Um, so that the, the thyroid sits there. And um, yeah, and so the parathyroids are these little tiny glands that sit right on top of the thyroid. So they're on top of the thyroid. So the thyroid hormone, or sorry, the thyroid gland makes a whole lot of different, or several different hormones. The calcitonin hormone that it makes specifically just goes and stimulates osteoblasts, okay? So if you're stimulating the blastic activity, so you're making the builders work harder, you're going to be taking calcium out of your blood because you're building bones. So if you are, so basically let's say you drank all the milk. Like I'm, as a kid, I just remember be, milk being pushed on us so much. Like milk does the body good. Do you have your milk mustache? Blah, 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 blah. And humans do need to take in milk or at least take in calcium some way. But milk isn't the only thing. You can get milk from, or get calcium from lots of different sources. But milk was really pushed really hard as a kid. And as a result, I drink a lot of milk now just because it's just always been a thing. I don't know. Other cultures, though, do just fine, and they don't drink as much milk as Western cultures. So it's a very – it's a weird thing. Um, 
anyway, so calcitonin. So let's say you've, you've eaten a lot of fish or something that has calcium in it, or you've had a lot of cheese, also has a lot of calcium. So you have a lot of calcium in your bloodstream because you just went through digestion. Well, your calcitonin is going to pick up on the fact that you have a lot of blood calcium. And it's going to say, you know what, I'm going to go store that in the bones. So calcitonin is the hormone that takes the blood calcium and puts it into the bones by activating those osteoblasts. So this happens even after puberty. It's just we don't grow a whole bunch. We just kind of start storing our uh, calcium in more co uh, compact bones. On the other hand, parathyroid hormone says, oh my god, we our blood calcium is super, super low, and I'm about to just, uh, my nerves are going to stop working because I don't have enough calcium. If you've ever had a cramp, a lot of times people say you need calcium. That's sort of part of it. Um, so, oh no, I'm going to take the bone calcium that's all built up into my bones, and I'm just going to start shaving it down a little bit so that I can get some more calcium in my blood. So parathyroid hormone activates the osteoclast. Okay, so it goes in and it says, hey, start breaking down the bones or we're going to die. And it raises your blood calcium. Okay, uh, this seems to be spelled right. Okay. So a good kind of test question would be blood calcium, if when it's too high, stimulates what organ? So ignore this part for a second. So if you say if blood calcium is too high, uh, what would you stimulate? So if you have way too much blood calcium, you would stimulate the thyroid and you would make osteoblasts. Um, you would make calcitonin, the hormone, from the thyroid, which stimulates the osteoblasts um, to make more bone cells. Okay, so to make more bones. So what if your calcium is too low? If your calcium is too low, you're going to stimulate the parathyroid hormone. You're going to make parathyroid, or you're going to stimulate the parathyroid to make parathyroid hormone. I know it's ridiculous that scientists thought it was a clever name. Uh, and then by stimulating parathyroid, this goes into the bloodstream and tells all the osteoclasts it runs into, wake up, get to work, start shaving off some of that calcium that's in those bones. We really need it in the blood so that we can send it to our nerves so that they can function properly. So very good test questions right there. All right. There are other things that regulate bone density, okay, so thyroid hormone and testosterone and also estrogen uh, can stimulate osteoblasts, especially during puberty. It goes in and it says, oh, we need, you know, depending on how many nutrients you have and how many signals you have, you can get growth during puberty. Um, we also see growth hormone. A lot of times um, there's a thing in the 90s where people were trying, they were worried their kid wouldn't be able to play basketball because they weren't tall enough, so they were buying illegal growth hormone. And growth hormone does what it says. It stimulates growth. And what that specifically does, so if thyroid hormone and testosterone and estrogen stimulate that blastic activity by telling the bones to make more bone, what growth hormone does is it makes more cartilage. And when it's making more cartilage, eventually the osteoblasts will go in. If it's cartilage within the bone, it's going to, the osteoblasts are eventually going to turn that into bone tissue. Um, very also important are some vitamins. So vitamins A, C, and D are really important. Vitamin A will turn on those osteoblasts. Vitamin C will um, create uh, collagen production, which is why scurvy, one of the problems when pirates or sailors didn't eat enough um, vitamin C or citrus, they would um, start to get weak bones because they were not taking in enough vitamin C. So their bones started to get weak and their collagen started to get really weak. Vitamin D is really important because it actually lets us absorb calcium and phosphate. If you don't have vitamin D, you can eat as much cheese as you want, but you're never going to get any calcium out of your diet. So vitamin D is really important. It's a weird, um, important connection there. Remember, so vitamin D actually is put into milk now because, you know, um, there's no point in drinking milk for the calcium if your guts can't absorb that milk. And so you have to have vitamin D for that. Another way to get vitamin D naturally is just to go, so the, we put it in our milk, quote unquote, unnaturally. It doesn't mean it's bad. Uh, but you can also get vitamin D by going into the sun for a certain amount of time. But remember, we talked about in the integumentary system, the problem with that is if you're in the sun for too long, you run the risk of getting skin cancer. So um, this is definitely, a, taking in vitamin D through your gut is a, a simpler way. Uh, okay. Okay. Let's keep going. So what happens if these things don't work right? So there's a couple of different pathologies we're going to talk about. What is rickets? So if you don't take in vitamin D, so if you never go into the sunlight, if you have a vitamin D deficiency, you just don't make the right kind of vitamin D, you get soft bones. 
And we know this happens because we have seen, um, we know this is the problem because we've seen that if you take someone who hasn't been in the sunlight ever in their entire lives and they have really soft bones, and when you have soft bones, you get this bowing effect because your bones aren't strong enough to hold up your body. Um, but you take them and you start giving them UV exposure, so showing them the sun, they start to heal really quickly, not sort of quickly. quickly. Um, so there was this horrible um, thing that people used to do in the like late 1800s or early 1900s where it was called baby farming. And the, the well-to-do, like in San Francisco and places like that, would send their babies to quote-unquote baby farms to raise their kids outside of the city in uh, like, you know, places like on a farm so they could get the some sunlight and run around and just be raised in happiness and then later the parents would uh, in theory go and get them from that farm when they were ready to enter society and uh, live in a city that was really dirty and they just wanted to protect their kids by letting them live in the country and it turns out what people were actually they didn't realize they were getting into or they just didn't care is they were sending their kids um, to these baby farms that were in the city in horrible slums where the kids were just like put into cribs and um, they were stacked to the ceiling and never seeing the sun. Like the kids would be taken out to be changed basically and fed and then just put back in their cribs. And so they were in these horrible dark conditions and almost every single one, if they didn't just get TB and die of tuberculosis very early, they would get rickets. And so they'd be born with very... Um, very um, uh, malformed bones, and that's what's happening in this case. Is these kids are were raised in darkness, and they never uh, developed. You can see, see that's just this long-term rickets where their bones are just not forming. Pro they're just too soft. Um, you can go in. It takes a lot of time if it's an advanced case like this in order to repair the bones, but it can be done. And the elderly, if they change their diet, or if just for some reason they're not taking in vitamin D or going outside. Uh, because maybe they have skin cancer problems or other skin problems. Uh, it's not called rickets. It's called osteomalacia. Osteomalacia. Uh, it's exactly the same thing. It's just it's, uh, they, you know, you don't, you don't want to be 80 and hear that you have rickets. That's not, you know, that the, the technical term for rickets is osteomalacia. And so you'll see people, um, if you see diagnoses of this, it's just that they are not getting enough vitamin D or UV exposure and they're not absorbing enough calcium. And so their bones are getting soft. Um, but it can be fixed. You just, you can stimulate that osteoblastic activity by taking vitamin D. All right. What if, what about osteoporosis? So the word osteoporosis means holy bones and holy as it has holes, not like spiritual. Um, so this happens especially in the elderly and especially in women because there's something about estrogen that, uh, or the lack of estrogen that causes this problem. Okay, so if you have bones that are less dense, so here's that spongy bone tissue and it shows that, so there are, while there are holes, the um, supporting structure is very thick. Okay, so remember it's got those holes so that it can be lightweight but still very strong. In osteoporosis, the holes are gigantic and the supporting structure is barely there. And so what's happening is you have way more osteoclastic activity than you have osteoblastic. If you have osteoclastic activity, you're breaking down your bones. And if you're not balancing that with osteoblastic activity, you're not just reshaping your bones, you're eating away at them to the point where your bones start to just become incredibly brittle. Um, and so this is caused by if you don't use your bones very much. So the body's lazy. It's not going to create these really awesomely powerful bones if it doesn't have to because osteoclasts and osteoblasts use a lot of energy. And so if you're not doing resistance training, um, any kind of resistance training, even just walks or something, but it's better to do kind of like gym style um, resistance training. Um, anytime you put pressure on your bones, they're going to respond by putting down more bone tissue. Well, if you stop doing that and you go to an extreme where you're just not using your bones at all, like you barely walk, you barely get up and do anything, you barely use certain muscles or bones, you're going to just, your osteoblasts are going to break it down to almost nothing because as far as your body's concerned, you're living the best life, set, life ever because you're not doing anything. Well, that's not true. You actually need that the tissue to be there so that you can act, do stuff, okay? So that's bone use, okay? You can also, estrogen is a problem if you are not, so once you go through menopause, you stop producing estrogen. Um, and when that happens, if you're not getting estrogen stimulating the blastic activity, 
um, that kind of exacerbates the, the effects of also not doing as much physical activity. Um, also, if you change your diet and you stop taking calcium or vitamin C, so this is definitely what happens in oops, people who are malnourished, and um, they, they could have plenty of estrogen, they could use their bones, but they're just not getting enough um, vitamin C or calcium, they're not eating the right diet. Um, especially like fast food diets can be problematic, um, you start to see osteoporosis. So you can tell somebody is uh, oste has osteoporosis if they fall from maybe shoulder height, just regular standing height, and they break a bone. That's how intensely different these two situations are. Okay, so um, you hear about a lot like, oh, someone fell and they broke a hip. Like, that shouldn't happen. That's, you're, you're taught, like, our bones should be strong enough so you can just fall from, you know, a normal height, not, we're not talking the top of a building. We're just talking from standing and falling um, and be able to withstand that fall. If you fall and you break a bone just from normal height, you have os you are most like you likely have osteoporosis. So your bones are so thinly, um, the spongy bone is so thin that, and like this looks like, I look, I feel like just looking at this, this is going to break. So that's how thin this is. So if you want to make sure that you don't get osteoporosis, one of, you know, people, I say this, but stock up on good bones while you're young. So do a lot of resistance training, uh, weight-bearing exercise, and eat really well the younger you are. Um, which, you know, if you're already older, this is like, well, thanks for telling me now, but um, you, it's, it's never too late to start doing it, okay? So, um, again, I, I, you've seen me. I'm not a fitness guru, but it is really important to do weight-bearing exercise. So you could be super awesome at using the five-pound weight, but once your muscles are adjusted to dealing with a five-pound weight, they're not going to put in any extra work, and then your bones are going to – their bones oh, – sorry, your bones are going to realize – well, I don't have to do anything extra now, so I'm gonna, I don't have to lay down any extra bone tissue. I might as well start getting rid of some of it. So it's good to keep increasing that weight-bearing exercise while you can. Okay, so that was uh, pathologies. So the two big pathologies for bones are rickets and osteoporosis. So rickets are soft bones, so your long bones are really soft, and osteoporosis are brittle bones because you're, you've lost a lot of that bone matrix. So let's talk a little bit about articulations, and we did this in one of our labs, but an articulation is just where two bones come together, okay? So there's three big kinds. We have our synarthrotic or synarthroses. So if you're, if it's an adjective, it's a synarthrotic joint. If it's, you're saying it's a synarthroses, then it's, that, that's the noun version. These are immovable joints, so once you're an adult, um, you cannot move them at all. We cannot move these sutures in our skull. They are um, just ossified shut, okay? So there's no way that this that used to be the fontanelle in a baby that was a soft spot, in adults, there's no way to move this. So that is a synarthrotic joint. We barely even think of it as a joint at all. We, the amphiarthrotic or amphiarthrosis joints are sort of movable. So our vertebrae, we can, because we know we can kind of twist to the side and twist back and forth and everything, we know that there's definitely some flex going on in our um, spine, but it's not very much. Like you can't, you know, you have to get really good at, you know, uh, even if really you have really good yoga skills, you're not bending your spine, you're bending more at the waist and everything. So that's a slightly movable joint. Um, another example is your rib cage. So your rib cage will, uh, we're going to talk about this later, but the only reason why you exhale is because you release your diaphragm and then your rib cage starts to push down on your, your, um, your lungs. And that pushing down of your rib cage on your lungs just by the weight of them will ex cause you to exhale. So it's not, um, and you can, you can cause yourself to exhale faster by releasing your diaphragm faster. We'll get into that later. But the rib cage um, joints are amphiarthrotic as well. So the ones we really think about when we think about joints are the diarthrotic. They're very freely moving. That's our elbows and our knees and our shoulder blades and all of that. But you'll see the more flexibility you have in a joint, the less protected it is. So the reason why our skull is so fused is because you have to protect the brain, okay? The reason why the vertebral column has a little bit of flex, but it's not like a slinky, is because you have to protect your spine, okay? And so you have to do, there's a lot of protection happening. And the, though in the case of our joints, like our, our knees and our elbows, there's a lot less protection, but it allows us a lot more movement. So when you have, the, so this is a synovial joint, okay? So the diarthrotic or freely moving joints can be separated into different categories also. The one we talk about the most 
course is the synovial joint. And that's just a very typical kind of um, joint where you have this kind of bubble that's filled with a fluid. And what that means is when these two bones are coming together, like this could be a finger maybe. And um, so I just had this experience happen where my rotors on my car Something got in between them and they started scratching and then they suddenly seized up because they ground into each other. So our bones have to worry about the same problem too. So that was with my brakes, but our bones worry about that too. So we don't want our bones to grind into each other because they'll start to break each other down. And then you have junk just in that joint cavity and then it's just no good. So to make sure that doesn't happen, we have an open space called a, um, a joint, that the synarthritic joint. So that's filled with fluid. And to make sure the bones aren't just like flopping around and they're all crazy, we have this joint capsule. And so what that does, there's cartilage in there and this membrane to make sure they're staying where they're supposed to be. So when you pop your fingers, what you're doing is you're popping, um, there's nitrogen that starts to build up and you're popping that back into the bloodstream. Okay, so, uh, bu -bu -bu. okay, here we go. So there's fluid that lubricates this joint. That's really important. If you, same thing with brakes. You have brake fluid to keep your brakes fl um, fluid uh, so they're not crushing on each other. Same thing with our bones. Uh, sometimes you have things called bursas, and they're just extra little sacs. That, uh, they're just extra pieces that kind of allow more cushion. Usually bursa are fine. That's not a problem. But if you have fl uh, painful joints, what could happen is that bursa has started filling with um, inflammation, and that can get really painful. So that's a problem. Uh, here are some other synovial joints. So even though the um, the ribs are considered they're diarthrotic, or sorry, they are. Let me. What are they called? They are amphiarthrotic. This is a kind of synovial joint. Okay. So here also at the axis where you have that turning point. Uh, but you'll see there's different kinds. So these, this can barely move. This kind of just, or that's, sorry, this is the clavicle that I'm looking at. Um, it just kind of allows for some pressure. We have these ball and uh, socket joints like our, our uh, scapula and our humerus where they come together and also our hips, okay, our femur and your hip also does this. We have these, and I'm not really worried about you knowing what every single one of these is. It's just an interesting example. We have these hinge joints, okay, like our elbow and our knees. And then we have the, um, what's called an ellipsoidal joint. So this is where the ulna comes in contact with um, your, basically right before your pinky. That's a different kind of joint. It allows some flexion. Um, it allows some pressure to happen there. Uh, but yeah, so our body is full of lots of weird and strange joints, and that's very important. Remember the axis and atlas, what's happening here is your, your, um, your skull sits on top of your atlas, and the fact that your dens here sits in this hole means you can move your head back, in, like basically pivot it on that pivot joint, and that's important. Uh, as far as bone accessories, we've learned a lot about the skeletal system today. A couple more things to know. Remember that ligaments are connecting... Oh, sorry, I, I told you wrong earlier. Ligaments connect bones to bones. Tendons connect muscles to bones, so that makes more sense. So ligaments are connecting your two bones, okay? So that ACL I talked about connects this bone to that bone, or perhaps your patella. I don't know exactly, I just know it's involved in the knee. And what a ligament is, it's a dense, regular connective tissue. It's a continuation of that periosteum. So it's basically just a different kind of tissue that kind of grows off that bone and then connects to the next bone. Okay, so if you are a meat eater, you've seen ligaments when they're kind of the gristle part when you're eating chicken bones. Um, so again, a ligament is where you connect bones to bones, and a tendon is something that connects bones to muscles. Uh, okay, I think that's enough for today, and I will see you uh, this weekend in lab.